Ready? All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday night Bible study. Uh, tonight, uh, the title is Antinomos, Pronomos, and Nomikos. And I'll explain those as we go. But first, I want to, the only announcement I have for tonight right now is that we have Mom's Morning Out, uh, November 11th at 9 a.m. So that's tomorrow. So now was it 9 to 1? Now, 9 to 1 tomorrow, we have Mom's Morning Out. And then I wanted to remind the parents with little ones that be encouraging your little ones to be memorizing Bible verses so they can come up front on Shabbat and hold the sword and recite their verse for everyone if they want. Reminder that they have to come and tell Rabbi Eric or myself and be able to recite the whole verse in order to come up and do it. So they need to find us that morning or during the week if you're here. All right. And so we are praying for uh, Fred and Robin, uh, Jerry and Sandy, Robert, Marquita, Mabel, Jeremy, Misha, who's in Africa right now and seems to be doing very well, uh, Zach, Jake, Gordon, uh, Rabbi Bell, Daniel, Ken, Glenn, Lauren, Kevin, Sarah, Rachel, Will. I just took one to the hospital today. He's actually, he's doing a lot better. His foot's healed up a lot. We actually took off the cast today. They've got him all stitched up. You know, everything's good to go. They got him a new cast and he's on his way to healing uh, fully and getting back on the skates. Um, Timothy, Tracy, Raphael, uh, Bethany. We're praying for um, also uh, Bethany's old boss. Uh, she's, um, she's been sick with COVID and I believe her son is as well. And so uh, we're praying for them to, that they have a swift renewal of healing. Uh, Miss Lita, uh, Cynthia, Amanda, Jim, uh, Francis and Joe, Renee, Denise, Zelina, Terry, David, Rob and Ivy, uh, Karen Hall, we're praying for Angie, uh, Donna, uh, Linda, and we had someone ask us today to pray for the beekeepers in our area and around the country, and I think for bees in general because uh, they keep, honeybees especially keep fluctuating between, you know, about to go extinct, extinct, and just on the cusp of being okay, and they're incredibly important to our environment. I don't think most people, most of us don't realize how important they are to our environment, so we, should, we need to pray that um, that part of our environment and agricultural system is uh, blessed and lifted up. So uh, I'm going to, to pray. Avina Mulcano, our Father, our King, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the country in which we live, and we have the freedom to gather together to study the Bible, Lord. This book, this collection of books and words that has uh, in some countries been banned and people are persecuted for reading or even talking about it. But Lord, we have the freedom to come here to express openly uh, not only the reading of its words, but our thoughts on its word, Lord, and that uh, we can come before you and learn this word, study it, apply it, and walk it out in our lives without the fear of being persecuted here by this country legally. Lord, we ask you to lift up all those who we have named to bring healing and renewal of spirit uh, to everyone on this list and those in our minds and our hearts. Uh, there's a, been a lot of healing this year, Lord, a lot of blessings poured out by you. There's still so much healing to go on, Lord, but we trust and know that you will bring this healing um, as you have been in many of them already. We've seen the healing. Uh, will is a perfect example of that. He went from in a lot of pain several weeks ago to uh, being able to joke around with me today uh, and, and laugh and and so we, I give thanks that, you know, he is on the mend. Lord, we ask you to lift up our, our environment. Uh, we, this has been an, an interesting year, Lord, just with our climate. We ask you to be with uh, the bees, Father. It's, uh, it's something that we don't, I don't think, normally pray about, but we do. They are your creation. They are things you made that bless not only us, but the plant life and the fauna that exists in our country and around the world. And we ask you to lift, we lift it up, Lord, as we pray in the Amidah that all of these things, all these benefits that do and reign would pour out on this country and upon our land. And we ask that same prayer for the bees and that the bees would be healthy and would continue to make our land healthy. Uh, Lord, we give thanks for all the things we have and the blessings uh, that we've received. Thank you, Lord, for the teaching and the things that I've been thinking about this past week. And I would ask, Lord, that, Lord, that all that I bring here tonight would glorify you and would bless those who hear and bring um, edification to those hearing online and here in the room today. 
uh, be with Rabbi Eric and Pammy as they're traveling on vacation, that they would receive the rest they need, Lord, to continue to lead this community um, and bless it as they have for so many years. And I give thanks and praise to you in the name of Yeshua, your Son, our King and Messiah. Amen. Yes. Is it the mic? Okay. I'm going to try to do this as neatly as possible. I can feel it wiggling, so it's like on its end. Okay. Is that better? All right. So I titled this teaching uh, anti, Antinomos, Pronomos, and Nomikos. And I'll get to my uh, inspiration for this about midway through and why I titled it that. But I wanted to, there's some background context for words and a little bit of history that you need to know that I'm going to go through first um, so that uh, what I'll say towards the end and later on the conclusion will make sense. So uh, Nomos is Greek. Uh, it has to do with law in general. It doesn't just have to do with the Torah, the five books of Moses. It can also have to do with any system of religious teaching. So the Torah, the oral Torah, can also be um, considered and called nomos accurately based on that definition. Uh, the word anti-nomos is actually coined by Martin Luther. Uh, these were, uh, he made up, essentially made up this word in his arguments against Johannes Agricole, who was a also a popular reformer in Germany uh, during Luther's day. And they were arguing back and forth about what role the law had in the life of a Christian. And so uh, many at the time held that the law still remained, um, even as just a point towards the gospel, um, but that it still had a place in the life of a Christian. Whereas Agricole um, expounded that once, you know, it only applied to unbelievers, that it was only for judgment, and that once you became, once you became to Messiah, that it no longer applied to you at all in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and agriculture can be said to have been the person sin, so grace may abound. That was essentially the theology of his teaching. Now, to be fair to him, later on he recanted this teaching towards the end of his life, but that's where this word comes from. The views of antinomianism are ranged between really three larger categories, but because there's so many subcategories within those three, I'm only going to list off some of the bigger um, parts, and I'm not going to necessarily number them. So one of the views is that the law is done away with. Grace abounds with sin. So the more we sin, the more his grace has to be in our lives and, and has to come into effect. So why stop sinning? I heard this in a, in, a, in a video once someone had said, you know, jokingly, why stop sinning when he keeps forgiving? And, and it's, it sounds terrible and tragic, and it is, but that's the, the mindset behind this idea. Um, the next one is that the law was never good to begin with. It was lifeless. Uh, the only thing it was made for was to point to the gospel and to point to Messiah. And, you know, in the Brit Hadashah, we do see the apostles saying that, you know, the law points to Messiah. We even say Moses saying, you know, one will come. All of this points to one who will come, but it wasn't lifeless. God does not create things that are lifeless or useless. So this view is, you know, a very uh, dead view. Uh, the next um, is Marcionism. Marcionism really was never classified as antinomianism because the word didn't exist, but the same principle applies. It actually doesn't even teach that the law was necessarily bad, but it teaches that God himself was bad. There was the bad God, and then there was Yeshua, Jesus, the good God who came to, you know, rid us of this, these burdens, you know, so we can have our ham sandwiches and, um, you know, uh, practice immorality in our lives. So... Marcionism is sort of the, I would call it the more extreme view of antinomianism. It's not only anti-law, it's anti-Hashem. Uh, it's anti-who Adonai is. Because, again, Adonai, you know, his word, all the words in the Torah describe the heart of Adonai, who he is, and what he wants of us. So Marcionism. Uh, thankfully, you know, surprisingly, the Catholic Church did uh, denounce it as a heresy but his teachings still prevailed, and we still have hints of his philosophy and his mindset even today um, in how people view the law, uh, especially in a lot of more liberal Protestantism. 
The Reformed today, um, one of the larger sects of Protestant Christianity, really define antinomianism as convictionless Christianity. So they sort of hold to the idea that the law is meant to convict. It shows you how depraved you really are. And it shows you, you know, you can't live a life that's sinless. You, um, you know, it's only to point to the gospel, only to point to Messiah. But this is a bad definition because, you know, constantly in Scripture we're told that the law is not just to convict. It's not simply to point to the gospel because it points to um, not just Messiah, but, you know, living for Messiah. It points not just to show our depravity, but it shows us how to rise above our depravity, how to, you know, submit ourselves and our hearts to Hashem and to walk before Him, uh, you know, not just in our, day, well, in our day-to-day life, but um, all the time. So Psalm 19, 8 through 5 says, The Torah of Adonai is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of Adonai is trustworthy, making the simple wise. So if it was only to tell us how unwise we were, and if it was not meant to restore the soul, but to point us to to the one who restores the soul, then this would be incorrect. And Psalms would be wrong and telling us that it restores the soul it makes us it makes you know Adonai's testimony trustworthy and that it makes the wise the simple wise the precepts of Adonai are right giving joy to the heart if we were to take Marcion's view of the law the law should would be anything but a joyful thing it would be this very sad oppressive thing which he viewed it as and was and was why he wanted so much of the bible cut out and really gotten rid of because uh, it wasn't a joyful thing to look to Adonai and say, yes, I will eat what you want me to eat. I will keep the days you want me to keep. The mitzvot of Adonai are pure, giving light to the eyes. You know, according to Marcion, and he's not wrong in this, only Yeshua gives light to the eyes, and he does. But he says that to point out that the law could give nothing. It gave no light. It gave no reproof. It was not worth anything. The fear of Adonai is clean and enduring forever. The judgments of Adonai are true and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold. If something is lifeless and never good and is only meant to point to one thing, then why would it not? Why does God say it's desirable if we say it's not? Yes, much more pure than gold. They're sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Cleanse me of hidden faults. Also, keep your servant from willful sins. May they not have dominion over me. Then I will be blameless, free from great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable before you. Adonai, my rock and my redeemer. So, if the law you know, was never good and could never direct us to do good, again, Psalms is wrong then, if uh, this is the case, because it tells us, you know, it shows how we can walk blameless before Adonai. It shows us how we can discern our errors and to show us where to, you know, where we can be on the right path again with Hashem. And so I think that is a bad definition. Uh, I prefer, I prefer to, uh, yeah, it's a bad definition of the law. How to be pronomos. This is the opposite of antinomos. And actually, pronomos is not really um, a word. It doesn't actually exist. It's just sort of the um, saying you are pro-law. How to be pronomos. Torah is for today. And Psalm one nineteen eighty nine. 89. If you'll turn there with me. Well, Psalm 119.89. Yeah. Forever, Adonai, your word stands firm in the heavens. So the Torah is for today. There, you, can't, you probably can't be more pro-law than to take a stance that the Torah still exists today. You, you stand against pretty much all of Christianity that, uh, today, which, a lot of which says the law is not for today. You can't do it. You shouldn't do it. You know, you're wicked to do it which would be a, a more Marcion view. And uh, so that's number one on how to be pro-law, pro-nomos. Uh, you know, the words of our master 
even our pronomos. In John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And he was the one who gave the commandments at Sinai. So all the commandments are his. There's, you, we can't distinct between some of the teachings of Yeshua in the New Testament and what was given in the Old Testament. Again, that's what Marcion did, and that's why you can have views like antinom antinomianism and uh, being pronomos, and because there's this divide that exists uh, in that view. So the, word, uh, the words of our master in Matthew 5 also in, uh, speak to us and say, you know, he says, Do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot or not a, not a stroke or a yod will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, keep that in mind, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so he tells us, you know, if you want to be pro-nomos, pro-law, don't relax any of the commandments. Teach others the commandment. Also keep that in mind for tonight. So, you know, he tells us, you know, to teach them, to do them. Whoever does them and teaches them will be great in the kingdom of heaven. And that our righteousness has to exceed what he considered at the time with at least what they taught, not always what they did, the Pharisees, was that your righteousness had to exceed theirs. And theirs was considered great. They were viewed as pious men in society. You know, they were well studied, they were well learned, and a lot of them did practice. We have this often, I think, a misheld view because, um, you know, we have what's recorded in the Gospels, and then we have everything else that was going on. And so, you know, we have Yeshua arguing with Pharisees, but then we have to understand that there were also many other Pharisees in the world, in Judea at the time, and many of them, you know, we have recorded as being followers of Yeshua. So not all of them were, you know, hypocrites or, uh, you know, these great uh, sinners that were just saying things and not following them up with actions. Uh, so Torah, you know, Torah means instruction. It is the standard for righteousness. It's what is holy, the standard for what is holy. It is the standard for what love is, loving God and loving neighbor. You know, right now, there's a lot of stuff going around, at least in our country, about, you know, we need to love. We need to love. But it's a very vague and ambiguous term. As I, as I like to say jokingly sometimes, I find that answer vague and unconvincing because it is a vague description of love because the way the world likes to define love is however I want to define love. It's not how Scripture defines love. Torah defines love for us. You know, you don't, bear false witness against your neighbor. You don't lie with your neighbor's spouse. You don't steal from your neighbor. You don't kill your neighbor. <laughs> and so, you know, the, it's, you know, to be pronomos is to recognize the Torah is the instruction for all of life. You know, what sets us apart from sin and wickedness and what teaches us to love God and neighbor. And uh, we're going to go to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for restoration, and for training in righteousness, so that the person belonging to God may be capable and fully equipped for every good deed. And so, you know, when, and then Psalm 119.42 tells us, you know, that, you know, you will have, God gives you an answer when you know scripture, when you, act, you know, you have an answer for those who taunt you. And Timothy tells us here that, you know, all means all. All of Scripture is applicable for us to have an answer and to be able to not only walk out our lives where we know what we're doing, but to be able to tell other people what we're doing, you know, why we have the hope in Yeshua we have, why we obey the God we obey. And, you know, this, this is another way to be pro-law, pro-nomos, to understand that it gives answers and that you can give answers uh, to others. And in Luke, Luke 2, 46, and you don't have to turn there, I'll turn there and read it real quick. Uh, After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the center of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. 
And all those hearing him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw Yeshua, they were overwhelmed. And his mother said to him, Child, why did you do this to us? Look, your father and I were searching for you frantically. And he said to them, Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I must be about the things of my father? But they did not grasp the message he was telling me. And so I love this part here where he's saying, And all those hearing him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. And so uh, I've seen plenty of movies where Yeshua is sort of portrayed as a child answering biblical questions with, um, with facts, you know, with, you know, it, it would be like one of the Pharisees in the temple saying, uh, you know, who was swallowed by a whale for three days and three nights and him answering Jonah. And then they're like, oh, you know, whoa, <laughs> this kid knows stuff. But no, I think it was more than that. I think it was, um, they were, I think it was more of a midrashic discussion. It, Yeshua wasn't answering them factually. He was answering them with deeper meaning of the scripture. He was, able, he was able to take what was either being read or sung in the temple courts and draw out of it life. You know, that was, is, was buried within. And so it's a, uh, you know, and that's what was amazing them was these, you know, these men were sitting here and there's a child answering, you know, very uh, probably hard questions with, you know, a, uh, a very deep spiritual understanding. And so, you know, another, another way to be ponomos is to follow this example of our master and amaze the world with the answers we give. Not in an egotistical way, not to be like, oh, look how I answered this, you know, question about scripture or how I answered these atheists in our debate about whether or not God exists, but to glorify God. Because again, Yeshua tells us, you know, you're to do the mitzvah before you're to do mitzvah before men to let your father in heaven be glorified. And so, again, it's not an egotistical way. You should seek to have good answers and answers that really do astound uh, those around you and yourself. And oftentimes, it won't even be you that are doing the astounding. It'll be as you're reading and discussing that you know the Spirit will reveal things to you as you're going on that then will be amazing to you, but sometimes it'll just come out amidst discussion or conversation, and that will amaze others as well. And that has nothing to do with you, but all to do with Hashem. Blessed be He. So my definition of pronomos, because again, it's not actually a word, is to be able to give an answer with the whole of Scripture, with the desire to use all of Scripture. Because again, so many, so many today don't want to use the Old Testament except as stories, but to use all of Scripture in word, and in deed. So even if you were using the Old Testament to answer a question, better to answer it with your words and to live it out. So, you know, it's one thing for a professor to answer a question about kashrut, but it's a whole other thing for that professor to actually keep kashrut. Because when his students come to him and they ask him a question about, you know, how you uh, look for ingredients or how you prepare uh, a meal during Passover, he's not going to answer them a textbook answer. He's going to answer them probably starting with a textbook answer, which is probably where Yeshua and the Pharisees would have started in the temple. But then he's going to give them an experiential answer. He's going to tell them, this is how I, according to the text, prepared my lamb, or what, you know, what the meat I ate during Passover, the bread. Uh, and so that's my definition of you know, what it means to be pro-nomos, pro-law. But again, like I said on Shabbat, uh, I have a life motto uh, that Jonathan, other Jonathan, Jonathan in Bible, not this Jonathan, says, you know, to go farther, keep going, go farther. And it's, you know, don't just be pronomos, be nomikos. Nomikos in the Greek, according to Strong's, is an expert in the law. And so this is where we get to my inspiration for the week. And everything else is background for the actual teaching. So now we, now we get started. <laughs> now we get to the meat. <laughs> so strap yourselves in. So Matthew 22, uh, 34 through 36, um, the greatest mitzvot. But the Pharisees, when they heard that Yeshua had silenced the Sadducees, I love that phrase. Um, because again, you have this contention between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so it's almost, you know, but the Pharisees, when they heard that Yeshua had silenced the Sadducees, and this is where, you know, I'm going to Generation Z this, 
And when the Pharisees heard that Yeshua had dissed on the Sadducees, gathered together in one place. So we all had to get together and figure out this man just roasted the Sadducees. We've got to figure out, you know, what he said. And uh, so we can possibly use his answer later on. Um, they gathered together one place and testing him. One of them, a lawyer, and that's where we have the word nomikos, uh, asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the Torah? And he said to him, you shall love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so that was my inspiration for all my thoughts this week regarding this. Now notice, this is another sort of let's not be too hard on the Pharisees and Sadducees and the lawyers then because Scripture tell us about answering fools. Don't answer fools. He answers them. So he's acknowledging, I think, in his, in his own words, which we find in Scripture, that they're not fools. You know, they're at least wise, maybe misguided sometimes, but they're definitely not fools. And they can be reproved. I think that's the greater example. And I think that's why we see so many Pharisees um, come not only to follow Yeshua, but even if they don't do that, they defend Yeshua from the secular authorities, from the Sadducees, who the Sadducees really were the ones who hated Yeshua. But that's why we see the Pharisees, uh, they, they could be corrected as long as you could show them where, using the Torah, using the prophets, they respected that. And so, you know, I want to push you, you know, don't, again, don't just be pro-law, be an expert in the law. And so, you know, where we start with that has all the importance um, in the world. And so one of, one of the examples I wanted to use tonight was uh, Daniel in the king's court. So Daniel shows up in the king's court. Uh, he's, if not a older boy, you know, sort of preteen age, a young, you know, at least a young man, um, a young, no older than a young man. But, you know, he's able to give answers as to why he's not going to eat certain things or drink drink certain things. And we know this to be because of kashrut, you know, because the meat would have been unkosher. Even the wine itself uh, back in the day was often prepared in skins, uh, many of them in swine skins. And, you know, Daniel, even if he did not know this, would have at least suspected this. And this is why he tells us, you know, we're not even going to drink wine. So it's not an anti-alcohol thing. You know, we're not, we're not drinking wine because we're going to be holy. It's, no, it's, it's, we're going to be holy because it's, we're going to avoid anything that could potentially be unkosher. So where would Daniel have learned this? In the Torah, but where? Where would he have started this? So, but where? And who? It had to be in Israel. More specific. Narrow it down. More specifically. More specific than Jerusalem. Well, where would he have been more often? Who? At home. Where would he have at home with his parents? He's living, yes, he's living at home. So if that's not an argument for homeschooling in our community, I don't know what is. Be in all seriousness, because, you know, he, he was able to go into a foreign land, cut off from his parents and his community, and still stand up. And I have no doubt that, you know, through the power of God's Spirit, he was strengthened to stand up. But this would have started in his home. This would have started with his parents, you know, instructing him in, you know, what was kashrut, what is holy, what does it mean to follow our God? Not as, just as an individual, but also as a community. We see later on in Daniel's story that he, all these things he doesn't do by himself, he does with his friends. So, you know, I, I saw a post earlier this week that was saying, you know, if, uh, you know, in a land where Nebuchadnezzar may be king, be a Daniel. And it's like, well, why not also be a, a Midrash, a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, because they were with him, and they made these choices with him. They prayed with him, fasted with him, chose to hold fast to what was true with him. So, yes, it's an individual thing, but yes, yes, it's a community thing as well. Um, always, forever. So education begins at home. Um, I pulled this off. This is a, a rabbi. He's not a believer in Yeshua, but I like this quote. Uh, rabbi uh, Shnur Zalman says, when a child begins to speak... The father should begin teaching him verses of Torah. And I, think I found mirrored in this Matthew 19, 14, where Yeshua says, let the children come to me. But I think, you know, these children probably wouldn't have been roaming just around outside on their own. Their parents would have been within some vicinity with them. I think it's more than just 
you know, let the children come to me, but in a way, bring your children to me. Bring your children to the living word. You should bring them yourself. You should draw them in by studying it yourselves and by reading it to them. Uh, my mother has a story where her professor became a uh, claims, um, and he still was a believer when he was a professor at the university she was at, that he became a believer at the age of two um, because he understood who Yeshua was because his mother sang the gospel to him all the time from, you know, when the pregnancy began um, through his, you know, the, the age of nursing, uh, through weaning. So he was with mommy all the time and was hearing about Yeshua all the time. And, you know, children are paying attention. And so by the time he was able to speak, he was already a believer in Messiah. So uh, I find great, you know, power and wisdom in that verse. You know, when a child begins to speak, even before they speak, you know, the father and the mother should begin teaching them verses of Torah, which is why, you know, some of the songs we sing on Shabbat are so beautiful and powerful because, you know, and we should try not to forget that and let them become rote things that we just do on Shabbat, but that they contain scripture and that children are hearing them and songs help us to remember. There's a lot of liturgy that I could not say, I could not tell you, but I could sing to you because I remember the melodies. Um, and, you know, it takes time to learn, especially more time as an adult, is what I've found. But children learn quickly. And so if we're impressing them upon them, you know, really from pregnancy on, then they'll, they will grow up already hearing these and loving these and knowing these. Uh, so another way to become an expert, this requires study. This is the hardest part of becoming an expert in law, not just Torah, but any law. In the United States, legal education lasts up to seven years. That's not just your bachelor's, but that's also you're studying law school, going to pass the board. Um, my uncle, I think, failed the bar exam all the times you could fail it before being, but he actually passed it, but it was like the last chance he had to pass it. And you know, I, I can imagine after the first time of failing something that's significant, you, would want not, you wouldn't want to jump back in a month later. You would want to take, you know, three, four, six months to study more so you could, you know, you know, pass the next time. And so, you know, that's potentially half a year. So you're going, you know, okay, you finish your bachelor's. You spend two years in law school, right? You're six years, six and a half, seven, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half. And so it lasts a long time and it's intensive. It requires uh, time and discipline. You know, and then you have continued studying and reading beyond the diploma and the bar. There's a reason why lawyers have shelves of books and, you know, and not just codification books because they're reading. They're constantly, you know, and laws, and laws especially in second relations, are constantly changing. Uh, I mean, if you were to take a look at the law books from 15th century England, and then compare them to the amount of laws we have in, you know, 21st century America, you know, there, there's going to be a, a vast number of changes. You may have one law that started off, you know, small and needed only by a certain community, but then other communities took that law to apply that to other scenarios that they were having to deal with, and then cities and countries and empires and so on and so forth. Uh, that's, that has to do with Islam, and that's another, sub, that's another subject. Another subject. Um, one of the greatest examples of studying I think I have to personally glean from is my father's aviation studies. My father became an aviator in 89, and I was born in 96. So from then to when I was born to when I was in high school and beyond, I always saw him studying. He always had pamphlets out studying you know, not just the controls and where those are, uh, but, you know, you have airtime laws. You have laws about flying, about where you can go and how long you can be there and who you have to talk to to be there. And now he teaches in a foreign country flying. So now there's even more laws that he has to know and even more, um, you know, rules that America may not have ever even tried to apply to its, to its airspace. But he's, continu he's continuously studying. So he's been a great example to me on, you know, that you never finish studying. Uh, and that, that's the same with any profession, with any dedication, is you are constantly reading and studying and increasing your knowledge. 
you know, being an expert in the law, knowing basic Torah. I had read recently in uh, the Didache, uh, uh, commentary on the Didache, that the Ten Commandments would have been part of the recitation of Second Temple litur uh, liturgy. You know, so these pe you know, the people then would have been reciting the Ten Commandments and have known the basic foundation, what a lot of people will call you know, the marital contract of Sinai. Uh, because it's uh, because it is the very foundation. You know, you have love God, love neighbor, the Ten Commandments, and then you have everything else under those. And if you can get those ten right, you can get everything else right just about. And we can argue about which Ten Commandments is the Ten Commandments another time. Um, but some of us are right in that scenario. Um, so knowing the Ten Commandments is important to knowing basic Torah. Knowing kashrut. This is important because it affects, it affects us from day to day. You know, most, this is probably the thing outside of Shabbat. And Shabbat is part of the Ten Commandments that we talk about the most. Uh, simply because, and you know, this was a teaching I thought I might get away with without mentioning food. But food is everywhere, and I have to mention it. So, um, and we, we, we eat it all the time. So we're, we're constantly looking into, you know, what is kosher, what is not. And it's the biggest obstacle. Um, you know, if I want to go and eat with friends that maybe are not messianic and are, don't keep kosher, it can, it can produce obstacles um, to eating with them. Because sometimes it may make me feel like I'm being too intensive about asking all these questions. And I do, you know, I'm looking at boxes, I'm looking at labels, I'm asking, where did you get this from? You know, uh, I went and visited my family recently and I had not even been talking with them 10 minutes when I had gotten home for dinner. Uh, and I, one of the first things I asked was, what is this meat <laughs> in the dish? And my mother assured me that it was beef. And so, and, you know, it's, it's something that we handle every day. So, you know, knowing and understanding kashrut is important in, to, in being an expert in the law. Uh, the feasts. The feasts are how the year is organized. All our days. You know, I, I describe the time in between the feasts as these sleeping periods. Now, they aren't really. We stay busy. You know, we're supposed to be studying and learning. But they are, they are slow. They're kind of quiet. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and, you know, everyone's running around, like, you know, setting up tents, tearing down tents, you know, lighting campfires, and, and it's, and, and then all of a sudden it's, whew, we're done, and then now we're kind of like, all right, um, Hanukkah? Yeah, and then, you, and then even then, Hanukkah, Hanukkah you know, it, it comes and, and, and almost passes too quickly, um, sadly, but again, the, the year is organized by how the feasts fall, and, you know, that, that we see this in uh, the secular world as well. Uh, businesses and schools operate on the calendar. A lot of them organize around holidays. Uh, you know, federal holidays, religious holidays. Uh, there are many schools nowadays who have gotten in trouble because they wouldn't allow not just Jewish children, but Muslim children to be able to have days off during uh, Ramadan and several of their high holy days as well. So, for example, where I had moved from recently, Dothan, um, one of the little towns above in Headland, a little town in Alabama you would have never thought would have had this issue, had to start granting children days off because a Muslim student had um, not been allowed to take off um, a day for one of their religious holidays. And it uh, resulted in the schools having to readjust their policy on days off and how children were allowed to have days off because of uh, that one person. And so, you know, it also organizes the... Uh, our year is organized by things like the tax season. You know, in Scripture we see tithes. When are tithes brought? When are tithes brought to the temple? Uh, the fiscal year, offerings to the temple. So not only tithes, but we have, you know, bringing uh, sacrifices at a certain time, you know, grain offerings at a certain time, families coming up to worship at certain times. Even prophetically in the future, we see that the nations will go up during Sukkot. It's a, spe it's a specific time, and it's legal. It's binding required. During the millennial reign. Yes, with a legal kingship. Community laws, things like crime, you know, debts and release, immorality, uh, resolution. You know, how often do we have courts today? Well, you know, crime is 
you know, probably the biggest one we can name. All, all the drama TV shows are based on, you know, someone murdered somebody and we got to figure out who and get them in jail. But what if we had TV shows on debts and release? You know, I mean, we have a country that legally is established. For example, Georgia. Georgia was a, um, where they sent debtors, people who could not pay their debts and had to go to prison. They got rid of them by dumping them in the colony of Georgia. And so, you know, we have history here based on this idea of debt and release. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, I guess it's funny now to think about, but, you know, well, Australia, Australians, we're, we're not going to talk about this, right? Immor- <laughs> immorality. Uh, you know, we have, you know, obviously plenty of laws against things like, you know, assault, um, adultery. Um, again, a lot of that, how we view adultery has changed in our own society, but there are still laws against it. You know, as someone who, you know, at one point was in the military, um, especially for officers, adultery, um, surprisingly, in the military, adultery is very, um, you'll get in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. Um, and so, you know, again, with a lot of our society's views on those sorts of relationships, it may be surprising, but there are still places in the country that have very strict laws and rulings on things uh, like that. Uh, resolution, you know, we have business litigation, businesses involve, um, resolving uh, disputes, uh, you know, real estate. Uh, right now, we're having uh, lawsuits in this country about votes and how, they were ca- and how they're being counted, how they were counted, and how they should be counted. And so, you know, we'll have lots of lawyers uh, who have either already geared up um, or will be gearing up to have those arguments. Uh, things like divorce. I probably pass outside of Alexander Shannara vehicle accident billboards. Divorce is this next most seen, which is sad, but that is a part of the law. And it's a part of scriptural law. Um, You know, we have, um, even between Yeshua and the Pharisees, we see this debate take place. You know, what qualifies as, what what is a reason to divorce your wife? And of course, um, I think probably a lot of people tend to give a bad rap to the Pharisees for having this expectation that it seems like they're saying we should be able to divorce divorce our wives for whatever reason. When really this was a question of the time. This was a huge debate between the houses of Hillel and Shammai. Uh, you know, uh, Hillel was more liberal on the idea of divorce. This is where we get, you know, certain rabbinic writings about you can divorce your wife if she burns your toast. You know, and the, I mean, I'm not kidding, but, uh, you know, sadly I'm not kidding. But then, you know, Shammai was more strict, you know, and, you know, you can't divorce your wife and, you know, adult, adultery only. And Yeshua took the position again that, you know, you should not. Uh, you know, divorce is only for what God prescribes it as, which is adultery. And if you do divorce your wife for any other reason, you cause her to commit adultery and you commit adultery yourself. And uh, so, yes, but again, an example of a legal discussion they were having uh, back during the Second Temple period. Reading other works. If we're going to become experts in the law, we should be reading what other people have to say. Um, a lot... Um, and I have fallen into this category myself, falling into the thought that it's only me and God, and I have everything I need between just me and God, you know, in understanding Scripture and a lot of the uh, rulings in Torah and, uh, you know, halakhic decisions, not only in the early apostolic community, but in communities today with MJA, IMCS. Uh, that's what commentaries are for. We should be reading what other people have to say because... Um, there may be something we don't understand or why a ruling was made. Generally, when we hear a ruling was made in the courts anywhere, whether it's a halakhic court in the Messianic community or a secular court, we just get the result. We don't actually go and hear the case presented, which is one reason why I was so thankful that uh, Rabbi Eric and I listened for you know, quite a bit to the... Um, the new Supreme Court Justice uh, and her hearing before the Senate. Justice, what was it, what's her name? Yeah, Barrett. Barrett, Justice Barrett. Because we were able to hear, you know, we weren't, just, we weren't just waiting on CNN to tell us that, you know, this woman Trump had, you know, uh, put up to be elected to the court. 
uh, was, you know, brought onto the court and, you know, oh, we've heard terrible things about her. But no, we actually were able to hear the arguments she made and the answers she gave. And, uh, you know, if you were actually listening to, you know, the in-depth part, uh, whether, it's, whether it's the transcript or people talking, you actually will have understanding. Uh, and again, that also applies to studying scripture. If you're picking out a couple verses, you're getting a couple sound bites. But if you're actually reading the full chapter, the full book, you're getting more context. You understand what's going on. You understand the argument being made. And you have you and then you were given that you have that insight on laws and rulings, and sometimes a lot of the times you know it's not a we don't even I'm not saying not to pray for understanding, but a lot of the times there's it's simply a matter of reading a few more verses, and sometimes I think God looks down at us and is like, please just keep reading, just a little bit, Lord, keep keep go farther, go farther, keep keep reading. You know, we find things like, you know, pre precedent cases, how communities make rulings. Uh, and, you know, this is especially important for us today as Messianic communities because, you know, we have our own decisions to make. You know, how are we going to, uh, you know, enforce, you know, kashrut here in our community? You know, here we don't allow certain foods to be brought into the building. We don't allow certain foods to be brought into the fridge. That's a halakhic ruling of uh, Bredan. Uh, another, you know, a way of being a good lawyer an expert in the law, is being able to provide a good case. This is one of my favorite little historical uh, bits, is that the Book of Romans for years was used in U.S. law schools as an example of how to present a case properly because Paul sets up his case against the people in Rome and the sins they're committing um, very well and very clear. You know, part of providing a good case is providing clear answers. Uh, there's a lot of good examples in, you know, movies and TV shows, and they don't make this stuff up, but there's a lot of unclear answers in law practice today, uh, which is often why we have to hire lawyers, is because they understand the muddied waters of, you know, the legal jargon. You know, we should be, we should be better than that, especially with scripture, with Torah. We should have clear answers, uh, using proper word definitions, um, you know, if a word has a definition, that's what it means. You can't take it and apply it in a way that doesn't uh, make any sense, or you think it can be used. It has to be used the way it was meant to be used. You know, there's a rabbinic practice, the law first mentioned regarding words, where a word in scripture, once it's mentioned, that's the definition you run off of. It's a, pre it's a precedent case with a word. And every time, every book that follows afterwards, has, you have to look at it through that lens uh, first. It might could mean something a little bit different, but generally it will never vary much because, again, it's built on that same initial definition. Giving accurate answers. This is one that um, I, is a pet peeve of mine, is when people don't give accurate answers or at least don't acknowledge they don't have an accurate answer or don't acknowledge that what they're giving is just their opinion or their thought because you know if we're to give like in T timothy says you know all of scripture you know can can be used for reproof if i cannot reprove someone using scripture accurately then later on if they figure out that i was not true clear and using uh, the words i was using then they can look at me and start to question everything i've taught them everything i've told them uh, one of the biggest examples, as we're here in November and coming up on the holidays very quickly, is a lot of the false claims about certain holidays that make their way into our circles. Uh, there's a lot of things. I use Christmas as a perfect example. Uh, there's a lot of claims about Christmas that have no basis in historical uh, writings at all. A lot of the times it's just uh, made up stuff. Everything is pagan. All of it. And there's a lot of things that actually just aren't true. A lot of it, there's a, most things actually from Christmas stem from, you know, later 19th and 20th century, um, what's it called? Oh, not tradition, but uh, with money. Consumerism, materialism, there we go. Materialism and consumer's practices. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with worshiping a European, a European forest god. Um, so there are some of those things, but 
you would think the way certain people talked about them that that's all it was and that's just not true it's not accurate and so if we're going to make good cases as good lawyers for yeshua's kingdom we have to make accurate and true statements about everything even the things we condemn and actually i think it's a greater wrong to condense to condemn something inaccurately uh, than it is to support something inaccurately because at least if you're supporting something inaccurately it's usually out of ignorance and you can repent but if you're condemning something inaccurately then you are the one who should be uh using the correct terms you should have you should have the case built up uh, before you and be able to give it properly accurately and truthfully uh you know a lot of this uh it's interesting because a lot of my studies right now in the dead Sea, the, the dead sea scrolls all the kuman texts reflect all the different opinions and practices of the second temple era the many different judaisms of the time period You know, you didn't have just one Judaism. You had several. You had, you know, the Qumran sect, the Essenes. You know, you had us. You had the Nazarenes. You had the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Uh, and you have the Zealots. You know, and so um, a lot of these, this legal jargon we have going on between Yeshua and the Pharisees and the Sadducees was commonplace. It wasn't like Yeshua was on the scene all of a sudden and now they had all these questions and arguments to go at. These were normal everyday conversations it would be like if the synagogue was just open for people to roam in and out of all day and we came and you had several different arguments have happening about halakhic decisions about you know my rabbi this my rabbi that and you know yeshua being a rabbi himself being a teacher would have been one receiving a lot of these questions and people would have gone from him and gone over to another part of the marketplace or the temple square and be like did you hear what you know yeshua said about you know about this about shabbat um just as an example uh, so the Pharisees asking him all these questions, this would have been uh, normal for the time period. This would be similar to, you know, going to Messiah Conference or Southeastern Conference and being in these large rooms with tons of people and d debating, you know, why there should not be, uh, uh, I'm not going to use that as an example, um, having halakhic debates amongst messianics because like there were different judaisms of that day one could argue that there were many messianic judaisms of uh today you know we have uh some in our walks some in our circles who are more orthodox we have some who are more uh conservative reform uh, we have some who are more hebrew roots some who are more fundamentalist hyper literalists um you know and we have some who were um, perfectly happy to just practice a couple things show up on shabbat and to you know go out about the rest of the days uh, looking uh, much like uh, Protestant Christianity. So we ourselves have multiple little bubbles and circles, uh, Messianic Judaisms, plural. So uh, we should seek to be lawyers. We, we, need, we should seek to be the uh, word, nomikos. Nomikos, we should seek to be nomikos, experts in the law. You know, not to just be pro-Torah, because we should be defending the Torah. We should be arguing within the Torah. You know, when we're having discussions with other Messianics, even Christians, people who, you know, sort of know Torah and practice a lot of Torah, you know, that should be the basis of our decision-making and our arguments. And to live within Torah. You, know, you practice kosher, you keep Shabbat, you keep the commandments, you keep the feasts. And we should be able to say why we do those things and why we don't do those things. And so... Uh, this, is, this is what a lawyer does. This is what a nomikos does. Lawyers spend their days arguing cases. Uh, and that's what uh, we should seek to do. Not as a way, we shouldn't be going out looking for arguments. But we should be seeking to better our defense of Torah and why we do it. And to convince others to do it as well. Because again, that's what you do in a court of law. You defend your side. And you also go on the offensive and you say, this side is, my side is correct. So... And again, not in an argumentative way, but in a way where you convince others to join along with you. Uh, because again, part of the fruit of the Spirit is, you know, uh, patience, peace, uh, and kindness. And if you can't make an argument with those things, then you are also still wrong. And uh, behind me tonight, I wanted to explain this at the end, because this is probably one of my favorite paintings, is by Paul Robert. Uh, it has to do with the judicial system in Switzerland, the Supreme Court. Uh, the judges would walk by this 
before they tried a case, every time it, it hung up above the stairs before they walked into the, uh, the hearing chambers. And so they would have to pass by it each time. And it served, you know, as a reminder, several different examples. You have um, what I like better about this versus our statue of justice is justice is not blind. Her eyes are not wrapped. Uh, you know, and this has to do with, I think, how we should carry out justice and how we should look um, at Torah. It's not a blind thing. We should be going in full, eyes open, uh, you know, looking for answers and giving answers. Uh, the sword points down, which is, I think, significant because it's not held as a weapon. It's pointed down as an instructional tool, a pointer down at, and I forget the Latin name, but it, it means law of God. And so you could say Bible, but the actual translation is law of God, and which the painter and the, the people who hung this recognized and understood that this, the law of God serves as the foundation for not only morality, but of all of mankind's laws. And if any of you have been counting, there are uh, 12 justices um, around justice in the painting. Uh, which, again, I think is significant because we see the 12 apostles um, in the Jerusalem Council who would have been responsible for making halakhic decisions, legal rulings for the early messianic movement. And so I think that's significant that they put 12 judges up there. Um, whether or not they did that on purpose or not, I don't know. But being a, a Switzerland, you know, being a Christian country at the time that this was painted, I like to think that it was done on purpose. So definitely don't be anti-law. Be pro-law, but don't just be pro-law. Also be an expert in the law. And that is all that I have for you tonight. So thank you. Do we have questions? Mary? Okay, and that's Friday. Yeah, if you want to give me that.